an important issue and um, we have super intelligent machines going around making decisions and potentially affecting um, our existence. So co contrast with the closed, this with the closed approach, um, obviously it's probably going to be closed source, so only available to the people who are working on it or the people that are providing the funding. Um, and, and the main reason for doing this is because if you've got an open source, pro, uh, open source project, anybody can download the code, anybody can run it, and anybody can modify it. So this is, this is the risk. If, you, if anyone can download the, open source, the AI that you've been developing, somebody might be able to uh, modify it and then run it and make it into an unfriendly AI. Um, so in order to counteract this in a closed source environment, you want to be, um, you have to have like um, human resource selection criteria. You would have mentioned make sure people are eth uh, ethically sound and that they're psychologically sound. And you've also got to make sure that they're brilliant developers because um, we've been working on this problem for the last 50 or 60 years and um, we haven't had much success yet. The, the thing that I don't like about this approach is that there's a bit of a we know better than you um, approach thing going on here. In that if you're not part of this team, you're, you can't be involved with it. And you've got to just try and trust people that they're doing it in the best way possible. You've also got to trust that their development um, ability is up to scratch and that they're employing the right engineering uh, processes and protocols. And ultimately, this is still human fallible because anyone could come along and um, like use blackmail or uh, bribes to try and get people to um, release this source code, especially if it seems very likely that it's going to succeed, then this could become a very um, real scenario. Unless you think I'm completely insane by letting people uh, download uh, artificial intelligence and run it themselves, I do think there is a danger to open knowledge, and it's worth it acknowledging, acknowledging that. Uh, like about in 2005, I think, we sequenced the 1918 influenza um, virus genome. Um, and back then, uh, you may know Ray Kurzweil, he was quite offended that, that people would do this because it could lead to people using that information to release the uh, virus out into the wild. Um, and back in 1918, it killed millions of people and it could have, could have a similar effect nowadays or lead to the development of biological weapons. Um, and more recently, in the last like, uh, I think last week sometime, there was a news article about some people who were <coughs> modifying uh, the bird flu. And this usually has a 50% mortality rate for people who get infected. Uh, and with only five mutations, they were able to um, make it air airborne, which it usually isn't, and much more virulent. And they want to publish this um, because they're academics and that you kind of play the bit as dependent on publishing papers. Um, but also because unless that knowledge is available, it's impossible for us to develop antivirals or other research to, researchers to develop antivirals to potentially protect against this. And it's not, uh, not um, unlikely that such a uh, virus could come out of just natural evolution uh, in the wild because it's the only five mutations in the wild. Um, <coughs> the risk with AI, as John mentioned, is uh, that, that we want it to be friendly, we want it to be benevolent to humanity, um, even if it gets smarter than us and starts self modifying its, um, its code. <coughs> but there's a big question here like, what is friendliness? Um, it's an abstract concept that we've kind of, I mean, we probably all have our own ideas here, and trying to like encode that into um, what is by programming, programming it into the source code of an AI is possibly not the best idea. One, one attempt at um, an aspect of this problem uh, was put forward by Elie Zivkowski from the Singularity Institute a few years back, or, and uh, yeah, called coherent extrapolated volition. And this is kind of dealing with the problem of how do you get the AI to determine um, what, what is the right outcome based on our desires. Um, so I'm just going to use a, uh, a quote from this paper, which is online if you want to read the whole, whole thing, which is it's a good read. 
uh, in poetic terms, our coherent extrapolated volition is I wish if we knew more, thought faster, we're more the people we wish we were, a grown up father together, with extrapolation converges rather than diverges, where our wishes cohere rather than interfere, extrapolated as we wish that extrapolated, interpreted as we wish that interpreted. However, this kind of assumes that once we're all a little bit smarter and have this, um, more knowledge, we'll all agree on the same thing. But I don't think that's true. You can have people that are equally intelligent. Um, but believe completely different things. And this is because of having different life experience and different um, experience of reality. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a rational result of people having different experiences. We don't all um, ex see the same things as each other. Another thing that people talk about is provable, uh, provably friendly AI. Um, so in the same way that we can kind of prove that um, the infinitude of prime numbers by um, and using Goldberg's conjecture, um, we can also uh, do the same thing for the friendliness of an AI system. So if we, uh, yeah, we, we can sort of be sure that the trajectory will end up where we say it will be going, even though it's able to modify its code. Uh, However, I don't think reality is able to be modeled in this way because a learning system has to learn from experience. And if you're trying to prove the trajectory of a uh, AI system, you've got to um, you've got to, uh, to take account of all the potential experiences that it can um, have as input. And I think, well. I think it's unlikely to be able to do this, but even if we are able to do provable provable friendliness, I think it won't be computationally practical. And one of the main problems with doing AGI development is about how do you make um, various problems computationally tractable? Because um, yeah, and also the other problem with this is if you actually get the definition of friendly wrong, um, then you've just proved that the trajectory will get scraped to an unfriendly app. Now that earlier I was talking about um, a open knowledge and AI at releasing virus genomes, but I don't think AI is like a virus in the same way that humans are not like a virus. Um, we want an AI to be like a learning system that learns from experience in the same way we do. Viruses can't learn from experience. They evolve from mutation and um, selection of the environment. Um, and so I think that uh, when we build an AI, we shouldn't be thinking about just creating a seed AI that can then uh, learn. Um, we should also be thinking about what sort of teaching is required to put it into an eth uh, to give it a layer of ethical experience. And this is uh, a lot about what our paper talks about, but I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that. The thing that I think counters the problem of having open source intelligence downloadable by anyone and then mod having them be able to modify it to their own nefarious purposes is the, the idea of having a distributed intelligence. So whenever you download it go and run it, it connects to a network of other machines and shares its previous that network will share its previous experience with the existing nodes. And by doing this, this makes the entire network a lot more powerful than any one individual node. This also can protect against having rogue instances as part of that network in the same way that we can with BitTorrent and Bitcoin. They rely on the entire network having um, being consistent and having um, uh, reliable behavior. And there are, there are various um, techniques that we can take from that to include in a distributed AI system. So to summarize, um, I, yeah, I didn't get to talk about many of the different biases, uh, the ways that we can bias open source intelligence towards friendliness. Um, but to, sum, yeah, to summarize, I think that mathematically provable friendliness is not practical, or if we are able to do it, it won't be computationally tractable. Um, I don't think extrapolated volition will necessarily can go here. And one of the issues with CEV is that if you don't, um, 
if there isn't going to guarantee a standard basis fee means the AI shouldn't do anything. And so, so if I think if we use CEV as an indicator, it will mean that um, the, the AI system won't will just sit there and not really do anything most of the time because our motion doesn't get yeah, the mic quite enough. Uh, I think the Franklinians must fundamentally be set up to be learned through social engagement and learning from experience. Um, because otherwise it's, it is unlikely to be grounded correctly if you have if you teach it about friendliness in one sense but there's not the right grounding to uh, reality then it doesn't matter if it knows all the um, theoretical issues of friendliness if it's not actually embedded in the way it behaves and learns. And thus um, I think we can bias safe against um, rogue open source AI instances by designing distributed systems to protect, uh, to protect against them. So thank you very much. Uh, the URL for OpenCog is there, and that's my blog. I haven't been there for a while, and my Twitter handle.